Hello, everybody, and welcome to our spoiler review for 2018's Halloween. I'm Dan Merle. I'm Roth Cornett, and Halloween is upon us, yes. Silver Shamrock. Now, if you've clicked the wrong video and you haven't seen the movie yet, you can check out our non-spoiler review, which is also on the channel a few videos back. So check that one out. This is for people that have seen the film. We're going to go into full spoilers. So this is your one and only blanket spoiler warning. We're going to be talking about the finale, about mm. the end of the movie, and all points in between. So let's get into it. Roth, it's been an interesting couple of days since our video, what's our review for uh, Halloween went up? It has, and I think part of the purpose of this review, besides to just talk about spoilers, whether yeah. you find folks that have seen it and enjoyed it or had questions um, or mixed response, whatever it is, um, talk about the specifics of that. So let's get into it, because sometimes with our spoiler-free reviews, we're not able to point to the exact things that are yes. either working or not for us and explain why they are or not. Yeah. Um, so let's get into that a little bit. What are some of your your kind of like top top spoiler moments that you wanted to hit on to illustrate your overall take on the movie? Yeah, um, I think that, and this is part of it is what I like about spoiler reviews is you can get into the nuance of it because we were both very mixed mm -hmm. on the film and I think both of us were kind of wavering in the middle and just happened to tip this way. Um, but it's hard to go into why we tipped that way with this movie without going into exactly why. So uh, I'll talk about something that I spoke about in the non-spoiler review, which is the tone of the film. And that was something that uh, I, I did not think that it, it, it was able to create a sustained atmosphere. And I think that's what puts... Mm -hmm. Uh, this felt like more of a generic slasher film for me for that reason. I think that, you know, your average film, this is what I really felt Halloween was for me. It was it was very average with some really great moments and some really not great moments. But overall, I thought it was very average. It's sort of episodic in the sense of, like, you meet a bunch of people and then one by one they kind of get picked off. And uh, the ones that don't really stand out don't have much of a, a, an atmosphere or mm -hmm. tension to them. And that's what I felt was the problem with this film. And a lot of it was the tone. Uh, the biggest thing for me was the scene with uh, the babysitter and the kid that she was babysitting. That's a really, really funny scene. Um, and I laughed a lot during that scene. But tonally, I did not think that it fit with anything that came before or after it. Uh, partly because we don't really know these characters that well. And that mm -hmm. was another problem that I had with the film was, other than Lori um, and a little bit of her daughter and a little bit of her granddaughter, the characters seemed like, slasher bait, which again mm -hmm. is something for me that is a hallmark of, of a very middle of the road film. And that scene was was really, really funny, but it was then followed by, you know, a scene of terror and then a scene of gore. And then even, you know, when Michael shows up, th that scene in the in the closet is the, the kind of the hallmark kill of mm -hmm. the movie. Uh, and the audience, you know, laughed at it because the kid goes like, oh, shit, and runs out of the thing. And, th and that becomes a laugh moment, but right. that didn't feel like it should have been a laugh moment to me. Been a scare. Uh, it felt like it should have been a scare. And I'm not saying that you can't have one or the other, but that that one moment sort of encapsulated for me what this film didn't have going for it, which is a real insecurity about what exactly what kind of movie it wanted to be. And it can be any kind of movie that it wants, but I think you have to make up your mind. And that was one of my big problems was this movie never really seemed to make up its mind exactly what kind of movie it wanted to be. Yeah, I would agree. I think um, I would. I, I don't mind mixing uh, humor and horror and yeah, scares. It and, can be done. It, you Scream, know, Scream famously yeah. did it, uh, you know, 20 years ago. Yeah. So that that I don't mind. I think what, what you hit upon is what I walked away with realizing where where my issue was as well. Um, and I want to talk about some of the things that I liked about the movie too, mm -hmm. with spoilers. Um, but was that it was trying to be all things to all people to some degree, and I don't. I don't think it was trying to serve an audience in that respect, maybe, but I almost think that David Gordon Green, director David Gordon Green, was trying to have it be all things to his Halloween fandom. Mm -hmm. Like, every fantasy he had had about a Halloween follow-up, right. he wanted to put in one movie. Yeah. Um, we talked about this a little bit, but I'll, I'll talk about the things that I liked and then get into the things that ended up tipping it. Um, because I walked out enjoying the movie. So if you walked out of this movie and you said after that that finale, which was so satisfying and I think really well shot yes. um, and well executed and the idea of like creating the traps and the doors and the things that were going to... I love that I love that entire movie. sequence with her walking through the house. If they hadn't copped out at the end of that, uh, yeah. that may have been enough to tip me. 
the over, other way. The, the other yeah. way, but then we'll we'll get to that. We'll we'll, we'll get to that. And there was another <clears throat> there was another one shot sequence as well that yeah. I thought was incredibly well executed, just in terms of uh, the use of the tools mm-hmm. um, and and the kill. I'm following Michael through these houses and the kills was incredibly well executed. But but uh, this is what I want to say that I liked. So if you walked out of that movie after that final sequence, because it ends on such a high note, going that was awesome, that was so great to watch that unfold. Mm-hmm. I get it. If you're a fan of of sort of the other Halloween movies and you like the fact that it was a send up to them and riffing on it, the end exploding Michael into a fiery ball yeah. is the end of Halloween too. And if you were happy to see that again. delightful you know Um, it's riffing on all of these movies I get that feeling I think that what he did really well was capture Michael Mm -hmm. in terms of the menace of Michael um, and Laurie and I think that it was an interesting take on Lori in today's world all these years on um, and the idea of someone that hadn't whose life had been overtaken by something that would be very traumatic. If I saw five of my friends murdered in one night, Mm -hmm. I'm sure that would inform the rest of my life as well, in whatever way that it did. Um, So the idea of of that trauma, I I think, was done really well. The stylistic flourishes, I think, were done really well. So there's a lot about it that I understand what people are loving. Here's where I think it gets a little wibbly. Sure. Um, Is one, to your point on tone, the nature of... I, I don't think he decided he wanted how the he decided how those kills should feel to us, the audience. And this is what I mean. There's a certain kind of movie where someone's m- murdered and you feel the the actual pain of it mm-hmm. um, and the actual angst of it. So the little dancing boy, the boy that was like, "I love spending time with you, Dad." In two minutes, yes. I fell in love with this kid. But I just, I really want to dance, you know? <laughs> yeah. And then he's so brutally dispatched. Yeah. And I understand that you're playing with the tropes of horror movies that Whatever allow... happened to his dad, by the way? I think he was killed. It's I believe one of those, he was... Did they show... Did, I, I'm trying I to remember. Did like, did they show him dead? Was, I can't remember. I think he was by the truck, like... Oh, maybe that was him. Yeah. Kind of That's the out. thing, is is that the fact that I can't remember... Yeah. Exactly. How, what, that that that's a whole other problem that we'll talk about. But but sure. I agree that that kid that's a char- that's an example of a small character that you know is endearing. Yeah. And you do feel a little bad. And then he's brutal. But what happened was in the first series of kills, mm-hmm. um, I th- I feel like, and this is something that I struggle with how much I like or don't like this. Mm-hmm. Um, it's undercutting a horror trope which makes people very disposable, right? Yes. Slasher fodder, like you said. With it allowing these brief moments of time, whether it's that communication with the kid with the babysitter, who's also lo- her friend. I almost called her Lori, Lori's granddaughter's friend. <laughs> yeah. But, which is the point, or this little kid or whatever, where you actually care for them. So emotionally, I'm not hitting the thrill point of, of, of the ex- the, of the strange visceral fantasy separate over there nothing i ever want to see in reality exhilaration that some horror films bring you with creative kills especially slasher films right it's not hitting that and it's not going farther enough in the other way um in terms of when you say then it's bringing these comedy elements and these silly elements uh, to be sort of like a gritty take on that that really explores that leaves the audience walking away wondering oh, God, I really have to confront why I would want to um, experience the thrill of a kill in a horror movie. Right. I, am I making sense? Like, it doesn't know what it wants to do. Well, I th- I, I think the, re- the, the, the thing that and it goes between is... that's only one thing. I have more. <laughs> uh, I, I think the best horror movies are the ones where you care about the people that are being stalked and or killed. Yeah. Um, you, you want them to survive. You root for them. Um, and then there are other horror movies that don't, to my sensibility, do not appeal as much to me where the people in them are just fodder. Yeah. They're just people who are there to be dispatched. They're, they're broadly drawn stereotypes. They're very, they're not very well, uh, uh, conceived or, or fleshed out. And I felt that this film had way more of that. Um, the friend on the fence who gets, two scenes maybe before he gets impaled on the thing that's that's it's a gory kill but i don't care about that guy because i the movie doesn't really 
I don't know him that well. The, the the friend that's the babysitter with the kid that gets killed. Again, she's in one or two scenes. Again, I don't care about her as a character. Her boyfriend that shows up that gets pinned up to the wall was in, I think, one scene before that. I don't care about that character. They're there to be killed creatively. Uh, and some, and in some cases in this film, if I'm being honest, not that creatively. The kills weren't even that creative. They were, they were in a way, this is both a good and a bad point. They harken back very much to the Michael of Halloween 1 and you know, uh, our own JT just, yeah. we were talking about it. Michael doesn't use the knife that much. He likes to choke, he likes to strangle people to death. And and, and, he, and he, he just kept repeating that. And you know who each of those characters are. You know who each of the characters in Scream are. You know who most of the characters in The First Nightmare on Elm Street are. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference for me is, uh, I want a horror movie, the, the kind of horror movies that I that I like, and this is all subjective. Some people like the body count, creative kill horror movies. That's fine. It's a completely different aesthetic, I think, and one that does not appeal to me as much. I prefer one where I know who they are, I don't want them to die, or I think it's it's you know a poetic justice that they die. Uh, and, and I felt that this was the so and, and so broad as far as characters that I don't care about whether they die or not. I really don't, uh, which puts it very down the middle of the road for me. And even characters that are in the film, uh, Lori's granddaughter, her boyfriend, what function? Well, he has given well, so much is, screen time and yeah. so like probably ten minutes of that movie are about. They're dynamic together. Mm -hmm. They, it's gonna be. They're gonna go to the dance together, and then he's kissing another girl, and she's angry at him, mm -hmm. and he throws. Like it seems like the only reason that he's in the movie is to throw her phone in the pudding or whatever it that is. was. And, but but that's ten minutes of screen time in that film that ultimately like he's not even killed. So so, so why is he in this movie so other that, than to be a plot device? Yeah, that kind of brings us full circle, and I think that that you hit an interesting point, um, which is I think demonstrative of what I'm trying to say mm -hmm. is that. I don't think that David Gordon Green went far enough in either direction to I satisfy agree. either. I think I I actually cared too much because he gave me just enough to like the characters in order for it to be just a dispatched thrill ride creative kill moment, right? Like Final but Destination. Like Final Destination. They do those. They do that, they do that so that brilliantly. Well. Yes. But. And they also, to your point, it's not poetic justice because these are all very kind, likable people, mm -hmm. right? So it doesn't hit that. It doesn't hit poetic justice. It doesn't hit, like, I don't know them well enough. It can just be a kill. And it also doesn't go far enough in terms of credit, uh, in terms of character development for it to be truly emotionally evocative. So what it lands in is nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, it's just too much of everything and all of nothing it's uh, in, in that moment. And that's where I think they're not effective. But then that brings me to your other point, which is riffing on Halloween one. There is a, there is, it's an insane through line, but there's a logical through line to what Michael's doing. Yeah. Mike, and I brought this up in our spoiler free review, but now we can get into a little more detail. Sure. Michael sees Lori outside of his house. He follows her. And then he he continues he, for whatever reason he's like gets fixated on Lori, mm -hmm. um, and he follows her through the rest of the day. And when he ends up doing, it's only four people he kills. I think that night. Uh, uh, th I think three that night, and then one other one. One off other screen. off screen, yeah. yeah. So so it's actually not this crazy bloodbath. Yeah. Um, but but he follows her, and then he kills the people that she leads him to. Mm -hmm. In this movie. It is asking us to suspend all kinds of disbelief and allow for all kinds of crazy coincidences because Michael, A, one thing that I think it captures is if he had been locked up that long, he would be really pent up and, and mm -hmm. just want to kill a lot of people. Fine. Um, and it's also a different day and they kind of note that in the movie, right? Right. Um, but he happens <laughs> to come across for no particular reason the babysitter is Lori's best friend. Mm -hmm. He comes across, I mean, not Lori's, Lori's granddaughter's best friend. Mm -hmm. He comes across her granddaughter and her friend. He happens to, everything just happens to happen. Some ha so, a lot of happenstance. A lot of happenstance to lead them to the very characters that we've been introduced to, but it doesn't really make any logical sense why Michael would find them specifically. That's one thing. And then two is this is the bigger problem they are operating as plot devices to, um, which that happens mm -hmm. in movies and especially movies like this, but to the detriment of characterization, what they do, the behavior doesn't make sense. And that's your point. You introduce 10 minutes of a, a boyfriend only so 
Lori's granddaughter can lose her phone. Yeah. That is his purpose. But never worse, seen again. Never seen again. And that's just one example. You introduce her friend so that when he kills the babysitter, we already have met her. Right. right? It's not just some rando. It's not just some rando. Yeah. You introduce, and this is the I think the most egregious one. The doctor. The doctor. You introduce basically new Loomis, which she says quite overtly, the doctor, and have him for no discernible reason at all, make, commit a brutal murder. And if this had been a part of the movie that then we explored, like he becomes, he's become so obsessed with Michael mm -hmm. that he becomes the new Michael, fine, that's kind of interesting, but that's not what happens. He's then dispatched. Yeah, the twist is, is revealed and yeah. then he's and then immediately killed. And then he, it's because it means, the twist means nothing yeah. and the only reason exists, let's walk you through it. The worst cop known to man, who apparently is the only police officer in this town. Who happened to be who, at the at institution every, yeah. 40 years ago. Yeah. This cop never calls for backup. He certainly doesn't. Why doesn't he have a partner on this night? He goes into a house where there's a domestic disturbance, where they know Michael is missing and people have been killed mm -hmm. by himself with no backup at all. He then takes this young teenage girl and instead of immediately getting her to safety he takes his car and hits michael myers with it who he happens to run who across who he happens to run across <laughs> and then the the this shrink who out of nowhere turns into a completely murderous maniac mm -hmm. kills the police officer and all of this all of this nonsense and i'm sorry to use that word <laughs> happens because the plot needs to get michael to Lori. And so literally the shrink exists and commits a murder out of nowhere in order to drive Michael to Lori so that they could have hit him, picked him up, put mm -hmm. him in the car, have him be unconscious long enough that he's not killing them in that moment, get him exactly to where he needs to go to Lori before he wakes up in order to kill only yeah. the only the shrink and not her granddaughter. Those two characters actually. Do, do you know what I mean? I know, I, I, and they they both represent uh, story shortcuts that bug that bug me in two different ones. The 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 sheriff will. They are Patton, plot fodder. They're plot fodder, and, and the way that they do instead of establishing those characters, they they take a shortcut, which really bothers me. Will Patton's character, the 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 cop, uh, is one called uh, I was there too, yeah. which is he is an he is an an unestablished character that has never been in any previous way, uh, has a tie not to the former film that we've seen on screen. It's literally just said like, oh, I was there I was there 40 years ago too. And that's his character development is just like, oh, well he was there, so, but that's it. That, yeah. That's his only tie to this and the only way, like how does he know Laurie Strode? He was there 40 years ago. There, there's. It's cheap. It seems like a very cheap way to just say like, I mean, you know, he was there too. He's and behaving then, insanely. And then the doctor, again, I think that was a very twist, which, you know, the idea that the doctor wanted to put Michael out in the open and see how he operated because he wanted to see what makes him tick. And I think it's it's intimated that he caused the bus crash somehow that that got Michael out into the world. Yes. That's an interesting idea. But then you dropped it. But they did nothing with it. Yeah. They, they, they don't really hint at it at all yeah. in any way leading up to it. And then the doctor goes crazy and he puts on Michael's mask and, and he stabs dead. the sheriff and the, and the jugular and, and, and or the cop and the jugular and kills him. And then he's immediately killed. So, so there was no point to any of it because other than just a cheap twist and a way, like you said, to get Michael where he needed to be. It's like those two things. It's just a moment to, to present some kind of twist to shake up the audience. Oh, it's not Loomis that you know. And um, and it's literally to get Michael to lawyer, Lori. The difference being like, you know. And Why it, isn't he just following her? Okay, imagine anyway. in, if you've seen Scream, spoiler, spoiler for Scream. Uh, if you haven't seen Scream, it's a good movie, you should. But it, it would be the equivalent of with uh, Billy, Sydney's boyfriend, revealing that he was the killer all along. Yeah. And then before he's allowed to really explain why, uh, he's just killed. Yeah. So it's a twist, but it's not in service of anything. And you, you never really, really understand why other than the, this, the, the, the script kind of basically tries to, to explain it, but it... it it's not, it's not, some people don't go to these movies for story. I get that. I understand that. I do.
Sure. I go to a movie asking, at least for cohesiveness and, and tone and script, we mentioned Final Destination. That's a completely different animal. Yeah. Those movies are setting out to do something creative completely kills. different. They are creative kills movies. That's what they are. That's what they establish themselves as. That's what they want to be. And I think they execute that really, really well. They do. And you feel the way you're supposed to feel. Right. This, this as we've been saying, this felt like a movie that wanted to be three different things and didn't succeed at doing any of Yeah, them. and I mean, I l it's interesting that you bring up, so spoilers for Scream since we're already there. <laughs> yeah. um, they set, they establish all of that, all of that emotional weight so early on. We know that his mom is gone. We know yeah. that that messed him up. Yeah. Um, we, we know we, that Sydney's mom did something. Something, we yeah. know. Well, we know that she, you know, about Cotton. We yeah. know, we all of this is established so far ahead of time. Mm -hmm. um, so that and and we're with him the whole skeet the whole time like yeah. we think we like her think she can trust him and so when that betrayal happens it means something we meet the doctor a couple of times he doesn't mean anything and then he really does something completely <laughs> insane and then doesn't mean anything yeah. um, so there's just nothing there and then to your point uh, it, in trying in, in terms of trying to do too many things at once and I brought this up as well it divorces itself from the rest of the Halloween movies and then riffs on all of them because it just can't decide what it wants to do. I was watching Halloween 4 actually uh, the other night and yeah. there's a scene in Halloween 4 where they're driving in a truck and they see Michael on the side of the road and somebody goes, and I hadn't seen Halloween before. Yeah. I did not see that movie before I saw this, the, yeah. the new movie. They see Michael on the side of the road and they stop the truck and they rev the engine and they and they, and they they hit him and they run him over. Yeah. Uh, but of course he's not dead and then it leads to, and it's, it, it is almost beat for beat the exact same it thing that the they do in this movie. Thing. And there's a lot of moments, if you've seen the other Halloween movies, there are a ton of moments in this movie that are beat for beat what happens in those movies and um i didn't notice this but but a friend of mine did notice that mm -hmm. they even had the silver shamrock masks yeah which you from, know, which is fine cute. it's a nod but but it's also here let's talk about some other things um the podcasters yeah. okay Let's break that down. They are also a hundred percent plot device, right? I loved they, how clueless they were. They were very, they and were very, they were very clueless. But the pot, well, much like people say we are. Sure, sometimes. fair enough. <laughs> Sitting on the ground. I just love the. I love the 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 yeah. the uh, knowingly and I think falsely macabre nature of we're going to go sit on the grave of Judith Myers. Yeah, and tell it was, her story. It's, it, yeah. Was so it was pretentious so pretentious and, and dramatic. And, so, and I liked that. Yeah, and that's the kind of self. Knowledge that I wish the film had more of, which is you're not presenting these things straightforward. You're presenting characters who yeah. are so full of themselves. And and they kill the wrong one. The guy is the one who's the most pretentious. And, of course, he doesn't get the, the, the death. It's it's his assistant. No, he who killed I thought them was, both. Well, I, 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 he slammed his head against yeah. the, the wall. No, but I then I think the last shot we saw was, was the podcast. You're like, well, I don't oh, know really? if they're trying to keep him awake for a sequel or something. Maybe I missed it. But, again... Those are the kind of characters that if they're killed, you're like, particularly the, 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 that's the gruesome kill. That's the one where you're like, these guys are full of shit. They're, they're totally exploiting this thing. Yeah. Um, I like them on that level, but, but ultimately you're right. They're plot devices. So they were, let's get Michael the mask yes. is what I would subtitle that. Yes. So, but here's a couple of things about them. Like, okay. So they show up and for, for whatever reason, this very special mental health facility that, and I want to clarify something that I think people understood, misunderstood what I said in the review. Most of the people that escaped with Michael, like when the cops were talking about where they were, they said, mm -hmm. oh, they're just chasing butterflies. The three of them are chasing. So they're clearly completely innocuous and mm -hmm. fine. Why are they chained to a human sized chess game you know so that's that was my question other than it visually looks cool now give me a reason but i think it would have looked visually even cooler if you have that same overhead shot and you yeah. have that massive thing and yeah. michael is the only thing in there yeah there are no other inmates other than you wanted to get the ah, yeah. shot of like that was almost like a rob zombie type thing it, it was uh, with the dog barking yeah. and the, uh, maybe because it was probably riffing on rob maybe, zombie's I guess, halloween but i think visually even it would have been cooler to have this huge open area yeah. and in the middle you have one thing chained yeah. up and that is michael myers uh, and you give him this wide berth 
Well, sure. But, yeah, sorry, but I agree. But, but let me let me just bring this point up. Okay, so that's what I was saying is like they have they have this like torture you know, facility mm -hmm. that they're calling the best facility. This is the nice place. Now he's going to get sent to the bad place, Yeah. Um, which is like, well, what does that look like, my God? <laughs> um, for people that are clearly not dangerous because you established it in your film. Yeah. Um, that's one issue, but that's not even the issue that I want to bring up, which mm -hmm. is that, okay, so Michael's facing this way. Why is he standing behind him to show him the mask? Why doesn't he walk around that square to stand in front of him to show him the mask to try and get a response and the only reason is is because we the audience can't see michael yeah, we're not allowed see to Michael's see his face, face. Yes. so but the point is if you can't find a more elegant way mm -hmm. to not see michael's face then don't do that scene because it makes zero sense to say i have your mask michael and then stand behind him there's a yellow line on the other side too stand in front of him and show him the mask yeah. you know or put him behind glass and in shadow and obfuscate him in shadow you know just like obscure him a little bit yeah. by 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 shadow and have him actually face michael like this this was all done um it was style over substance it, it the behavior the human behavior mm -hmm. was sacrificed for either style or plot through again and again and again and 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 their entire purpose really was to have Lori deliver some exposition and to get Michael the mask. To get him the mask. And to be the first two big kills that we saw. Yeah. So that's fine in a horror movie. I'm just saying that one moment really, by, like why are you standing behind him and showing him a mask? He does not have eyes in the back of his head as far as I know. He <laughs> may. He may. He is but he, pure evil. But he's also been Idiot. shot in the, I mean, well, no, he hadn't been shot in the eye. He got the... He got, uh, he, got the, uh, he got the old coat hanger in the eye. He got the old, uh, in yeah. The, in the first in the one. In the first one. And then oh he my. got stabbed. And he got the needle in the neck. Yeah. And he got shot somewhere. But the point is, like, we don't see Michael's face in the first one, but we never wonder why we're not seeing it. We're not seeing it. You see it very, very, very briefly. Briefly, but, yeah. right? Like, but it, but there are reasons for it that don't throw you out of the, the total experience. Well, because he's, he, in the first one, he's, and they, they sort of try to establish that. In the first one, he's not a, as Loomis is not a man. He's, no, a, he's, yeah, a he's, a, he's a force. We were actually talking about this. We were working on something the other day. I was talking to Spencer and Joe, and they was like, why is he called The Shape? Like in the credits, why is yeah. he credited as The Shape when his name is Michael Myers? Yeah. And I've always said that I thought that the way that Carpenter and Deborah Hill envisioned it yeah. was his name is Michael Myers, yeah. but he's not a person. Right. He is a force. Yeah. And so they call him The Shape because to call him Michael Myers would humanize him. Right. Uh, the shape is is the what he what, what his essence is. It is it is that force, that unstoppable force. He's he's not a person. He is a he's a concept of just death. Yeah. Um, that's the, my theory. And, and and it's and that part I think they did well. Let's talk about Michael and Laurie, which yeah. I think is. Let's the, talk, yeah, because the, there are some things the movie the, did well, and I think it gets yeah. overwhelmed for us by the things, a lot of them that they did not do well at all, but there are some things the movie did do well. Exactly, yeah. and I think that to bring this back just so I understand, I walked out of that movie feeling like I had really enjoyed it because mm -hmm. I liked that ending and there were aspects of it too that I really enjoyed. And then as I thought about it and unpacked it, because um, I walked out, because during the middle of the movie, I, I, I was going, I'm not sure where he's taking this. Yeah. I'm, I, I, I feel like if it's leading to something that really has this something revealing to say about the slasher film genre in general, I'll be delighted. Yeah. But it ultimately kind of didn't get there. So let's yeah. talk about Lori. Now, as I said, I think that the way that they approached her and the idea of the trauma was very, very interesting. However, the actual execution, I thought could have been done a little less on the nose, a little more subtly yeah. in terms of sitting down. Some of the moments in terms of she shows up at the restaurant, she's she on the verge the of house. hysterical. Yeah. She drinks all of the wine and I think there's a way to, and then it's not that she drank the wine. It was then it was then commented on. Mm -hmm. um, if if you just show it and you don't then tell it, you know, mm -hmm. if you just show her that she keeps drinking all the time, I know she's an alcoholic. You don't have to tell me. Yeah, you know, because um, we see her because we see sitting it sitting outside and yeah, also doing yeah. right. So I think that there was. There, and I'm not sure the solve for this. For me, I was thrown out here and there by moments that felt too overplayed. That hand was so overplayed mm -hmm. where it's like, well, 
I get that she's traumatized. Of course she's traumatized and I get that it broke her family. Yeah. But but it it became very broad yeah. in its delivery. Does that make sense? It did. I, I, Jamie Lee Curtis is great in this movie. She is fantastic. Like Jamie Lee Curtis's performance is amazing in this movie. I worship her. She is a queen. I loved seeing her triumphant in the end. I love that final confrontation. One of the reasons I think she's so great is because you're right in the sense that leading up to the third act, they give her three or four scenes in which she's essentially playing the same beats. Yes. And she's able to find different ways to do that inside each of those scenes. And it, and it, for me, it, it at least kept her performance interesting. Yes. And, and it kept her character on track, whereas it, it, I think it could have been, with a different performance, very repetitive. I think she was able to, to vary up, to take the material that she had and give them all a different enough of a different energy so it didn't just become a repeated beat. Because I think on the page it is. Yeah, I, I agree. think on the page it's... Lori, Lori knows she's coming. She's very overwrought. She wants her family to be better about protecting themselves, and her family thinks she's crazy. Right. And they play that scene out three or four different times, and then you get to the third act where, surprise, she's not wrong, and then they all band together and yeah. fight Michael, which um, they gave Judy Greer the, the, hero, the, the, moment. the hero moment. Which yeah. again, uh, although you, uh, I, I love the moment where it was very, it's a very cute nod to the first film, and I, and, she but I like the one where she disappears from the from the balcony, and that's a great one. But then Judy Greer, I thought, got the hero moment. I get that you're trying to make this multi generational, but I don't, I just don't know if they did the leg, legwork to do that. I, well, if we had, if we had, I think that again they told he. I think we could have eliminated a lot of these ancillary characters mm -hmm. and, you know, all of the time spent with these ancillary characters and yes. really just had it be the story of this family trying Strengthen to reunite yes. um, and have them be broken together so that that coming together at the end of these three generations, it was great. It was very satisfying. It would have had more oomph if the film had focused more, more, and it had been more patient because then you really have to be patient. Yes. And the first film is very patient. You, the, the first film, and, and really, if you go back to the beginning of the genre, a lot of them required you to be very patient, yeah. uh, which I don't think is a bad thing. I've seen a lot of people comment saying that they saw how the original one and it doesn't work for them because yeah. it's it's boring. You, it takes forever to get to the deaths. Sure. It's, it's it's slow. And I and I get where that criticism comes from. My counter to that would be that those films are setting up character. They're setting an atmosphere. Yeah. They're setting a tone. They're setting tension. They're uh, oftentimes they're setting up plot uh, uh, set pieces that would that will pay off later in the third act. I think that Halloween works because you know the geography of where everybody is. You know where the kitchen yeah. is. You know where the the kitchen door is. You know that they're across the street from each other. You know and you upstairs never know where and Michael downstairs. Might be. You never know where Michael might be. The fact that he's looming in the background for so much of the movie, yeah. I think, works so well in the third act because you don't know if he's right behind you. I I, I disagree with that assessment, or at least it's it plays differently to me. Yeah. Um, I disagree too because if, if this film doesn't do that, it's 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 much more standard slasher. And, and it's trying to speak to a modern audience and yes. give you kills faster. I mean, some of those kills are clearly there for the audience. Like they're not even for Michael. Like they're, they're for, for the us. audience. It's been ten minutes yeah. since we killed somebody, well, and kill we need somebody. to kill somebody. Which again is a very standard modern thing, and I get, but that. That, again, that that to me is a little bit where you get into the more mediocre films and that you don't really have anything to do or say and you just have to kill somebody because you have to keep the audience interested. And yeah. I think you can do a slow burn horror movie and it can work, um, but it's not going to be a mass appeal. Hereditary is a very slow burn did not have mass appeal. That's true. And I get, I really, I, again, I understand if this is the movie you want. I super understand it. But, I do. But I, but I will say, like, if they had, if those final moments, first of all, they reshot, apparently, they reshot the last 11 minutes of the film. So it was not that, mm -hmm. um, which I think is, it's clear because if it if if he had always been driving towards that inevitable conclusion, meaning director David Gordon Green, sure, um, I think it would have felt like a different film throughout. I think it is. It does feel a little bit fragmented and and like it's trying to be all of these different things at once. Um, it's trying to be every Halloween sequel that you ever wanted to see. Mm -hmm. um, but those final eleven minutes, if they had been really, really, really 
structurally, like if that was the inevitable conclusion of this movie and it had been built that way, ah, oh, I mean, that would be like, that would be like mind-blowingly that's, epically awesome. And it was so cool as it is. That's what tipped me over, I think, to, to, to being more on the negative for this movie is we get to the third act. And that, that sequence inside Lori's house is great. It's so cool. Going through the room with all the dummies, and ah, you don't know which one of them is him. So cool. Uh, the, the, the balcony moment where the she falls of off, the and doors. then she's gone. Yeah, going into each one and locking the doors down, and the gates and everything. And they, they made the same mistake. And, and something that I think that they were trying to advertise as, like, this is the showdown you've been waiting for. If you're a Halloween fan for 40 years, Laurie Strode is back and she is going to face down Michael Myers for, you know, to settle this once and for all. And you even set it up. They get him down into the basement. They close the gate. She lights the house on fire. And if the movie had ended with Laurie and her daughter and her granddaughter on the front lawn watching this house burn. But no. And 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 Laurie, you know, even, uh, Laurie's face, you know, realizing that maybe she can finally let go of this. Maybe this tortured past of hers is finally gone. But no. You have to show that Michael Myers isn't there as the house is burning. And you have to show him and you hear have, him and you breathing have to behind hear the mask. breathing I guess at the end of the credits behind the mask and you have to set up a sequel. So Going all this way and t going through all of this story work of Laurie and her tortured past and, and everything that she's gone through and fighting Michael, it does not even give you the finality that Halloween H2O did. Exactly. Where you at least, th th we thought briefly until the next film that, that she actually had killed him. Yeah. Uh, you don't even get that. So it, it's for, for me, it's and almost- And pretty definitively. Pretty definitively, like as, like as definitively beheading. as you can get. And, and then of came course back. they undid it in the <laughs> next one and then killed her off in the stupid way, which yeah. you know, and really just kind of led us to this. But um, if you take resurrection off the table, I would argue that Halloween H2O gives Lori a more definitive and satisfying ending to her story than this film does because they can't even end it but of the, course they're going to leave the, it open to a sequel it, it's and, a, the resolution to this conflict doesn't come it's just another chapter and there's going to be another one and maybe she'll be back again yeah and then we'll do this again and it's just if you're going to end it end, end it. it yeah and 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 that's the other thing and not that there's anything wrong again like in that version of the story she is traumatized she, yes. she's changed her name she's changed her identity she's she's trying to protect her kid mm -hmm. um she believes michael will come back uh but but she's functioning right mm -hmm. and so they were able to have a person that was functioning within great trauma which by the way i'm actually someone that believes that that we don't have to have characters that are able to function really well within mm -hmm. trauma sometimes things are too much um mm -hmm. and that would be too much probably for most people to watch those brutal murders and yeah. and, and survive it um but that said it, it, you're right it's like you 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 wanted us to have this visceral moment of satisfaction with Lori. She's been waiting and waiting and waiting and training her kid. And finally, the one thing that I would say pays off is that the training her kid and sacrificing her right. daughter pays off because it helps her daughter survive. And now she's been vindicated right. and her granddaughter survived. And so she's been vindicated in all of the things she's lost. And then he's freaking alive. Come on. That's so messed up. <laughs> like, so this is really just a big fancy reboot. So it was a reboot, not a conclusion. Again, that's something that a very mediocre horror franchise does. And again, and it's, that's I, I honestly the way that they were marketing this, not in comparison to the original, the way that this film was marketed and sold, and what they set up expectations for. And it's not a thing of subverting your expectations and giving you something you don't expect. I think it's the idea of putting a fresh coat of paint on the same reboot that we've gotten from every other franchise in the last however many years. And it doesn't even give you the 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 dignity or the the service of of pretending like this has any kind of resolution. Yeah, and I would say that and that worked for the first movie. It worked for the original, and I don't think it works for this one because they're different thematically and they're setting up different things. They are, and they're in different context. And yeah. I think that this, to your point, is like. I think some people would argue, well, that's exactly Halloween. In Halloween, Michael always lives and you can't kill him. And so they're they're really honoring Halloween in that sense. And I understand that perspective. It's just in my perspective, from a storytelling perspective, 
you have to decide the the idea of the final girl is it, it was a very specific trope, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of like she basically earned her survival through um, virtue um, and then and then trial by fire, essentially, basically, right? Resilience, resilience. So those two things, like the final girl, and that doesn't change much here. Mm -hmm. Those three, that generation, they are they represent virtue and resilience, mm -hmm. um, and in. In Judy Greer's case, I guess uh, a little muddled. Uh, healthy skepticism, healthy perspective, perspective you know. Uh, you know, Lori represents total resilience, mm -hmm. and um, the granddaughter is quite virtuous, and mm -hmm. she's not unlike her. Her grand, she's a very kind person. She is. Um, so, so all of that, all of that aside, is like, but the but but what this movie needs to decide is who's your protagonist? Is it Lori or is it Michael? You know, because in one version of this, the movie is driven by Michael and our need to know more about, which we never will, mm -hmm. about Michael and to follow him. And in another version, it's to follow Stor Laurie. And I get that it's designed to follow them both. I just don't. And the first one beautifully coalesced. We did. We followed them both. They both mm -hmm. had literally as he was following her, so were we. You know, yeah. as he was learning about her, so were we. And we were the person that was behind Michael. We were stalking the stalker. You know, right. in that sense. But in this movie, they're they're split apart the entire time well, it, until it, the end, which is this great epic moment that you then undercut just the same way you did with the shrink. I don't think the picture. I, I, there are two portraits of Michael in this film, and, and and again, I think they conflict with each other. There's Michael, the unstoppable uh, force of evil that you, as an audience, should fear yeah. because the characters fear him. And there's Michael Myers, the creative, gruesome serial killer, who every time he kills somebody, the audience goes, <laughs> which is what happened yeah. a lot of times in this movie. Those are two different types of slasher killers. That's that is that is uh, early Jason Voorhees Jason. versus late Jason yeah. Voorhees. That is that is Freddy Krueger versus Michael Myers. Freddy Krueger's the flashy guy who does things with a bit of panache. Yeah. Michael Myers so is the style. guy who who just gets a knife and stabs you. Yeah. And walks away. Yeah. This one and both of those characters. And I again that speaks to two different audiences. I'm not saying you should speak to one over the other, but when you speak to both, that's where you have the sort of clashes that took me out of this movie. And I know there's been a very long discussion, and probably the people that didn't agree with us at the beginning of this video aren't gonna agree with us at the end of this video. But maybe you'll understand why we but landed. But hopefully they understand what yeah, yeah, why we why we landed where we did. Because we're yeah. not seeing anyone's right or wrong. Not at all. Criticism is more than like and dislike that's 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 reviews which is something else like yeah. review is i liked it i didn't like it and here's why a little bit i think that criticism is going into the, the mechanics of it what worked what didn't why did it work why didn't it work it's not so much about good or bad it's about just dissecting a movie and and looking at the insides of it like like a like a watch yeah and you know picking at the sprockets and looking at why this one ticks a little bit and that one why is it a second off and it's a little bit different and that's what i like to do that is the good thing about the spoiler review is it lets us really dive into yeah. like we're not telling you should agree with us we're just explaining why we ended up where we did not at all and i i know i've said it a bunch but one final time is i get why people love this movie yeah because there's a movie in there that i love too mm -hmm. um and there are moments in there that i was viscerally satisfied by too as a fan of the halloween franchise and the slasher franchise yeah. and the good and the bad of it i love the good and the bad of all of that too i love the so bad they're good horror movies and i i really really get it yeah. not that this is a so bad it's good one i'm not saying Saying that at all yeah um, I'm saying that there's a movie inside of this one that I love so much that I think I'm a, I was ultimately a little disappointed because there were about four other movies in there as well yeah. that I was less affected by and it muddled my overall experience so that I walked away just torn about how I felt about it some things I love some things I didn't I can't say it was an overall um, success story in my mind um, because it felt very muddled. Yeah, I'm with you. There was, the, I, I at times, I, there's about 30 minutes of the movie that I loved yeah. in there, but it kept cutting to other different movies in the middle of it. And, and that ultimately is what swayed me ever so slightly on to the side of saying, like, it just really wasn't for me. And the same way that a lot of people, and I've seen it in the comments, have said, how can you like Venom? And how can you not like this movie? It's it's not binary because I, I think if you watch both reviews and you listen to what I said about both movies, 
my opinions for these two movies are about here. Yeah. Uh, it's just that Venom happened to go this way. Yeah. And Halloween happened to go that way. But it's not like this. It's not like no. Venom is here and Halloween is here. They're literally like here for me. It's just a degree of this much yeah. one way or the other. I interestingly enough, I mean, you and I agreed almost entirely about what did and did not work about Venom. Yeah, we just... We just, it ultimately, and it wasn't that dramatic for me either. I just ultimately sort of tipped the other way on yeah. Venom. On Halloween, I'm, I am, I think I'm still riding right in the middle of... The things that I loved, I really loved yeah. and were satisfying. The problems that I had disappointed me yeah. because I wanted it I wanted it to be a more cohesive whole experience. But these reviews are not about convincing anyone to because I think there's probably reasons that you guys would disagree with this or that things worked for you in a way that they didn't work for us, and they're probably really well justified for you. And that's what's cool. This is yeah. just to open the door to the conversation about because it's so subjective. Yeah. Why ultimately we respond to things or we don't and then look at the craftsmanship and and tease out what's there um in my mind that the filmmaker is or is not trying to do and how successful they are or not are not what's the name of that the, in the last season of game of thrones where everybody got together and it's like cersei and Jon snow and daenerys like yeah. everybody just like met that's what this should be yeah we should all just when we're talking about movies we should all just meet in a old whatever that was the state of epicenter i don't know yeah. epicenter that's not I even can't. a thing amphitheater that's also not a thing back then Whatever that was, I don't we should all just be in the I know middle the of that thing, about. and someone will fly in on a dragon, yeah. and we'll just let everybody can just put their swords down and let's just talk. Yeah, because that's the fun part. Yeah, is just having a good conversation and debating and not hating each other and just talking. Yes. That's the, that's the, that's what criticism is. It's talking about movies. It's not about finding the consensus. Yeah. it's not about finding. Okay, we've decided it's good. This is the, this is the part is 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 a civil discussion. You can agree, you can disagree, but nobody's calling each other names. Nobody's doing it, doxing anyone or whatever else goes on. It's just like let's all just have a good time. That's yeah, what movies are that's supposed a to true be. horror movie. Yeah, um, that's agreed. A that's a horror show. Agreed. Uh, this is this is a space for us to talk about movies in depth, and we hope that you enjoy it, and we hope that you leave your comments and um, happy to happy to hear other mm -hmm. folks' perspective. Yes, um, I would love for our little slice of the world to be a place where we eliminate the idea that that disagreement means avarice, it, not avarice, mm -hmm. sorry. Uh, uh, not, I didn't mean to say greed. Um, <laughs> that disagreement means... means uh, aggression. Aggression, yeah. yeah. Or, yeah. or there, there's no need for it. No, there's really know? not. We disagree all the time. Yeah. We're, we're still friends. Yes, We work together exactly. every day. Every day. Not just, not just the two of us, everybody here. Yeah. You should see me and Roxy talking about movies and me and Lon. Yeah. It's crazy. Nobody well, agrees on anything around here. Not at all. Lon <laughs> and I just had about 15 minutes on Harry on wizarding. So anyway. <laughs> you should have heard it. <laughs> you should have heard it. It was insane. It I was still pretty crazy. Still love that line. I had to close my door. It was, it was nuts. But they're still friends. It was a spirited debate. It was a spirited debate. <laughs> we should just put a camera in the corner. <laughs> No, we should not. We should not do that. Um, you guys let us know what you think in the comments below. What did you love about Halloween? What did you maybe not love? Uh, let us know in the comments, and we'll be back with more reviews. There's so much stuff coming so out. So much stuff coming out. Uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, yeah, I believe. Yeah, next, next week. The next week we'll be talking about. So maybe people, uh, we can talk about that one too. Yeah. I think I think there are going to be a lot of thoughts on, on Bohemian Rhapsody as well. I think so too. Well, thanks for joining us, and we will see you next time.